Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Uh, welcome to uh, another one of America's Islamic Heritage Museum uh, Behind the Arts. Um, today, um, we're featuring Behind the Visual Arts. Um, we're featuring Professor uh, Naja Abdul Musawa, uh, who is a professor in, in, in Carbonville, in Illinois. Uh, he's a very creative artist. Um, I've, I've, I've uh, seen one of his topics he, he dresses about banjos, you know, and I find very unique. Um, there's a banjo that uh, came up out of New Orleans, a historical banjo, and it had a, a crescent on it. And so when I see the brother does his work in, in ba banjos, uh, then there's a, a, a work that he does about Fatima and the door uh, uh, of beginnings, you know, I, I, you know, come, you know, come on, man. You know, the, the door of yesterday and, and then the hope of for tomorrow. Um, so I don't want to, uh, with no other further ado, I want to let my brother come on and talk and share uh, as we engage. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome, brother. Wa well, alaikum wa salam. Alhamdulillah. Uh, I first would like to say all praises be to Allah and Allah alone. And with the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. I, I, I want to thank the, the American uh, Islamic Heritage uh, Museum for, and Cultural Center for inviting me to, for, to this, for this opportunity to share what I've uh, uh, invested quite a bit of my life into is the, the visual arts. And, uh, and as he mentioned, I am a professor and I teach painting, drawing, and art history at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois, as he mentioned earlier. And there, uh, I, liked, I like to say that I'm going to show you an image, uh, not right now, but I'm going to show you an image of me and another gentleman. I want, and, I'm, and I put him in this, in this slide because he was a student at the university in, in the early 90s when, with me. We both were students, undergraduates. The funny thing about it is that being a Muslim and African-American and being in higher education, I didn't have many people to talk to about the Black experience. I didn't have many people to talk about the Islamic experience. So there was a sense of isolation, you know, that seemed to, uh, uh, you know, in my early academic career. So when this gentleman came to the art program, he, he, I found out they said, oh, there's a, a, a guy from Malaysia, an Asian guy from Malaysia that's, uh, that's st studying uh, art, he's a painter. And I said, what, in the art program? He said, yeah. So I went looking for him when I found him, he teased, he, to, to this day, he teased me because when I saw him, I like, hey, is you Jamal? You Hasna? He said, yes. I said, you Muslim? He said, yes. You an artist? He said, yes. I said, we got to talk. And so we <laughs> spent our undergraduate studies talking with each other and inspiring each other from a, a standpoint of otherness, being mm -hmm. not American, but at the same time, being American for myself and African-American, him being Malaysian and Muslim and me being African-American and Muslim, we had a bond that allowed us to engage in a conversation visually that has uh, impacted my life uh, for a good number of years. And, and the beautiful thing about it, the reason I put the, uh, this first, when you see this first slide, that it's a picture of me and him and it's a 20, almost a 20, almost a quite, not quite, but almost a 20 year span from the time we was in school together. And then another image of us in the same position when I, he invited me over to Malaysia to have an exhibition at the museum over in, in Penang Island in uh, Malaysia. And so mm -hmm. I'm, I, 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 when I talk about the visual arts, it's totally come from a, a perspective that's not common. I, I, when I go into various circles to talk about uh, art and I, and I talk about Islam uh, and I talk about the African-American experience. Now the African-American experience has, has grown tremendously since the early nineties. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. I mean, you can find so much information. There are a lot more historians, curators, collectors, and so it's it's a beautiful thing that that being able to see some growth. But in terms of finding African American visual artists, there are not many of us around. And one I like to mention is Ann Saunders, who's in Jackson, Mississippi, who also was a professor at Southern Illinois mm -hmm. University, who is a who I have so much respect for, as an educator, as an intellectual, as a visual artist. And, 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 and the beautiful thing about that, when I was in undergrad as well, 
she was teaching. She was a professor when I was an undergrad at Southern Illinois University. So I then Allah blessed me with a professor who had Islamic knowledge and experience in the visual arts. Allahu Akbar. I, I was so, I was, I mean, I, I couldn't ask for a better, a better relationship during that period of my uh, academic growth, during, during my academic career. Having a professor who had the Islamic uh, relationship as well as African American, and then find a brother who's Malaysia, who was a, a, a Muslim and also a student trying to figure things out as well, and had this type of energy early in my career. And so, Mashallah. I know your professor, Ann Saunders. Her, some of her works hangs in my wife's uh, prayer room downstairs. Oh, alhamdulillah. Oh, she's, yeah, uh, she is a, a, a well-respected uh, visual artist. And I mean, she uh, has, uh, matter of fact, has, they all talk about earning your due. She has done mm. that and some, if I may. Mm. And yes. so, the, so it, early as a student, it really was a challenge. So as time went on, you know, and, and if I could change the subject a little bit, I find this type of, right now through this COVID-19, we have, I find ourselves feeling a sense of isolation because I'm thinking about the isolation I felt as a student and not having those connections. And then, and, but it was fun thing about it, one of the things that I learned during that period was being able to do for self, focus on self, you know what I'm saying? Th you know, you know, do not look for exterior things to blame in order to develop one's int what you call self-accusing spirit. Yeah. And yeah. so here it is that uh, this particular COVID-19 is really it really makes me think because not only not only do I find it beneficial in terms of self-evaluation, I had that I had that self-evaluation I went through as an undergrad and was blessed to come in contact with individuals who, who was not concerned about the isolation as much as about the self-development. Yeah, you know, and, and that is important time, you know, and that is the blessing that I guess with that Islamic mind, or even if you take your good Christian or believer, you take that mm -hmm. quiet time. You yeah. know, this COVID to me is like going to the cave and, mm -hmm. and, and going in that cave, you gotta make tall off. You gotta go with inside yourself to reflect oh, upon yourself. Want. How to make yourself a better human being, a better person, you know, time to pray and less stress about worrying about chasing that dollar, you know, about going to that job, you know, yeah. oh my God, you know, so you, you, you know, and Allah always reminds us, well, out of darkness comes light. Out know? of darkness comes light. And this, and this, and this, it's, I find myself as a visual artist in this particular period in time dealing with the fact of, uh, this idea of isolation. I don't, I don't feel the pressure that a lot of people talk about. And I think because my my Islamic reference allows me to be able to pull from pull from that that I also use in my work because when I go into my studio, I feel like I'm in a womb. You know, mm. I feel like I'm in a womb. You know, being being nurtured. You know, I'm not just in there. I'm I'm not totally in control. There's other forces in, in control. You know, and, right. and, and that's motivating and molding me and shaping me to to, to, to come into this life. And as a, as a visual artist, you know, and, and as a visual artist who has who appealed to his Islamic heritage as well as his African American experience and heritage, I think that this situation for for for, for Muslim, especially if they are artists, is not as difficult in terms of dealing with the fact of isolation or having to deal with self a little more. Uh, just not no one. Hey, hey, nobody can leave the house. Everybody, oh my God, I can leave the house. Or no. I, and I, I must admit, and I like to share this with, the, with, your, uh, with your audience, that I also was incarcerated. So here it is, I spent 10 years, in, a little less than 10 years incarcerated in the penal system in a cell. I remember writing a poem one time saying that, uh, <laughs> that the, uh, the cell was my skull and, and I was the brain. <laughs> and, mm, so, mm, and so this whole idea of isolation in my life has not, it's nothing new in terms of my experience now. So now I focus, like I did when I was in the prison cell, I focus on learning. When I was in undergraduate and I felt the sense of violation, I focus on learning. And what should I be doing now? Focus on learning. And so me as a visual hey, artist. Yes, sir. Uh, do you use, you use your art or how can you see using your art as, art as also a healing process? 
Yes. So I heard you talk about that 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 oneness when you're inside that womb of your artwork. Mm -hmm. it, I find I find it interesting because when 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 you when I studied art in, in acting when I was in school, one of the things I love was the fact that when I think of color, I think of the creator. I can't look mm -hmm. at colors in the creation without thinking about the creator. There's a science to way colors to, for how everything is painted in the creation, the colors of the trees and bushes, the sky, the buildings, all this is this, this is this is fantastic, you know, and there's so much there that how can I be bored or you know limited when there's so much okay. there to work with? But I, I hear you now. You, at, at that uh, perspective, you know, everybody got a perspective how they see things. As an artist, how do you see creation? I, I heard you say mm -hmm. about the different colors. Like one year, I seen the different shades of the browns of the trees. Mm -hmm. You know, some when the sun hit it this way, some when the sun hit it when it's at, uh, at late evening. You know, you, mm -hmm. not even talk about the fall. So show us somehow how you see that beauty and that diversity. When the creation is constantly changing, and, and, and there are signs in the creation, as we as we are told from the Quran, there's there's instructing signs in the creation. So if this COVID COVID nineteen situation is telling us to pay attention to the creation, pay attention to what's going on. If we not read the signs, then we're not going to be able to feel comfortable in in learning and, and experiencing what we need to under these particular conditions. And so I found I, I found my art has been very instrumental in terms of me navigating myself by paying attention to the creator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Of all things. And so here it is that when I so when I go out, when I when the sun come up and watching that way that sun hits the trees and the shadows, beautiful shadows and beautiful colors and oranges and blues and yellows, it's just it's just phenomenal. It's it's mm -hmm. it's hard to sometimes to even to explain. If you're a musician, you probably can understand. If you're a poet, you would probably understand. But technically, if you're a person that really is into understanding self in the context of creation, you can understand it as well. And so, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that has a lot of impact on my work. And in, in speaking of my work, uh, the first thing I would like to sh share with the, uh, with everyone is my Fatiha series. And the Fatiha came about as a result of my trip to Ghana, Africa in 1999. And when I came back from there, the impact that it had on me was, was, was rewarding. When I went, I got invited to Ghana to have an exhibition at the, at the Panifest, Panifest Conference in, uh, at the Cape Coast uh, Cultural Center. While I was there, I supposed to be in there one week. I called my wife. I said, "Sweetheart, I'm not coming home. I can't. Stay. I'm gonna stay longer than a week." She said, "What do you mean you're not coming home?" I said, "No, I'm just still gonna stay a little longer." So instead of <laughs> <laughs> instead of staying one week, I wind up staying six weeks. Wow! So I can learn. I I travel too far not to learn, and I stayed in a Muslim village, your know, community, mm -hmm. which they, they welcomed me. They, I got treated very well, and I had opportunity. They even had a small mass year that we got up early in the morning. We made a lot, and so but I got a chance. I got a chance to visit the slave castles, and one of the things that I one of the things that I brought back to America, to my studio, was the door of no return. And the reason I brought it back because when my experience when I talked about the, the African brothers and sisters over there, they was talking about all the good experiences they had been having with African Americans and Africans from different uh, parts of the diaspora coming to Africa and to Ghana, and they were talking about how great it was. And so, so I had wrote a note in my in my sketchbook about this is not the door of no return, this is the door of return. Mm -hmm. How do we go back? So I created a body of work that talks about going back to Africa in a more celebrating, rewarding, and contributing to the constructs of eco economics, social construct, as well as uh, political. And so I created this body of work, which I like to share at this point. Oh, this is a Hassan Al Jamal Sedone, who I went to school with, and this is a, a, a the first photos from nineteen early nineties, and then the other photos from two thousand and eleven, when I was in Malaysia. And those are actually the Muhammad Speak images I got from Muhammad Speak newspaper and created these prints and this installation 
at the museum over in uh, on, in, uh, in Malaysia on Penang Island. But if I can, let me see. Here we go, Fatih Island. Okay. Here we have one of the uh, of my paintings. It's a relatively uh, a mid middle sized painting of conservative considering the fact that I created some that are small and I created some that's extremely large. And so here we find that uh, in this particular piece, I used the Fatiha, the Fatiha, the seven verses, the opening, the opening uh, chapter of the Holy Quran to create my composition. And so in creating the composition, I looked at the dot. At the beginning it said Bismillah, you have the dot under Bismillah. So I put these little dots in there because the dot it's the beginning of an artist on an artist's brush. It's the beginning of a scholar's pen when they put it on a, on a, on a paper, and also uh, congealed blood. So this whole idea of the beginning, and then I created this 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 doorway this, going back into Africa. This kind of this glowing uh, uh, environment with this blue path over the Atlantic Ocean back into Africa, back into uh, 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 to the uh, to where we to what we have uh, in some in many ways been disconnected from, but we still but we still have the opportunity to go and and, and learn what's going on in Africa and learn what's, uh, uh, what we can bring back to America. And while I was there, another thing that I found interesting is that uh, this idea of the burlap bags. I saw a lot of harvesting with burlap sacks. They was they was uh, picking up uh, fruits. I mean vegetables and, and so forth. And, and they had these machetes. And they didn't look. They they was talking, laughing, singing. And, and when I looked at the harvesting, I I thought of slavery, which I thought bothered me a little bit because I'm saying well, I've been indoctrinated to think about harvesting and burlap sacks as being associated with slavery. So on the way back, I was. Wondered if I had did some sketches in my sketchbook, and I'm trying to figure how I want to use this these notes to create a a, 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 a piece of work. And so what I did was I cut the burlap up because while I was thinking about more, I thought about the idea of going back into Africa and this connection back to Africa and this whole idea of this Islamic influence. If you put it all, if you put all the prayers of the slaves that came over to America into a burlap sack, it would explode. And so that's why you see it spread all over the canvas. So this idea of, of spiritual power and, and historical power of the African Africans who who, who, went, who came over throughout the diaspora and kidnapped and brought to America. Another thing in terms of the Fatiha, if you look on to your right, you'll see a band going down. And then when we go to the next slide, you see this dark band that's going down on the side of the canvas. And that and then and then it says the do not let someone pull you off the Musta King the straight path that blue path that you're going back into Africa and going back Islamically don't let them pull you off the path because some things will be hidden around these dark corners and so as a result it's just, that's that's a sign to say do I do not let it be intimidated by the unknown sometimes we let the unknown to intimidate us and here I want to be a part of the whole dialogue of the seven verses. You know, the straight path, to be not put off the Muslim king. There's no God but one God. I just want to share a couple of more of these images with you. The technique that I use in painting these is I did a lot of glazing process and liquef li liquefying the paint and, and having the paint just run across the surface, create different layers of texture by not only with the burlap, but the, even the, the, the quality of the paint. What I'd like to um, uh, uh, talk about now is the Fatah and the door of the diaspora. I created an installation. Uh, I, 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 I pushed myself to not just create these two dimensional pieces, but to create something that spoke to an environment. 
And this mixed media installation that I'm about to show you is a visual discussion of African, the slave ports known as the door of no return, excuse me, yes, and the growth of Islam in America's African-American community. I am not interested in telling a story of oppression, but a story of being and contributing and building with the powerful wisdom of the rich soils of African-American life. So there are collage news uh, articles and ads in the interior uh, allows the viewer to enter the tomb, if I may, which reveals some history of African-American Muslims in America. This is, the one, this is one installation. The piece that's in the far back of the wall is 10 feet by five feet. So it's a very large uh, painting of the Fatiha and the door of return. But in the center, you see the structure. These are each panel, each wall is eight feet by four feet. And I cut, wind up cutting the opening so you can go inside of, of the piece. What's interesting about this one, I had it on an exhibit on, in a couple of museums. Uh, the people would sit down, they would take their shoes off and walk into the, on the car, walk on the carpet and walk into the space. And it was interesting how the people who did take their shoes off would just lean over and look inside. They would not step on the carpet. They would not step on. It was interesting to how, watching how people were responding to that particular piece based on the respect that they had for Islam and the, and, and the religion. And so I had provided an African uh, uh, Ghanaian stool for people to sit on if they wanted to take off their shoes. And they some did. What's also interesting, if I may, when you go inside, you see these articles, some from the Muslim Journal, some for New Horizon, uh, just a, a number of different publications, Islamic publications that dealt with uh, the American experience. And it was interesting because at one exhibit at the reception, an older woman came up to me and said, is there really a, move, a Muslim golf association? Uh, she, uh, did you just print that and, and, and uh, did you make that up? And I said, no, there's actually a Muslim Golf Association. So it was interesting that all the information inside is, was not constructed to create this artificial world, but it's actually from publications that actually are distributed in and outside the United States. This is a close-up of, of some of the images that's in there. Now the structure that you saw earlier that was in, that was standing up that I'm just showing you, when you take it apart, you can exhibit it in a whole different in a whole different way. This is another way of showing or exhibiting in a space where it may be better to have it against the wall than to have it sitting in the center of a room. And so this is another way. Actually, this particular piece can be exhibited in five different ways. It's five different presentations that this one body of work. Can evolve, can um, uh, evolve, and go through this almost like this metamorphosis of a of, of presentation. And for one example, if you turn each one of those panels over, the centerpiece will have the texture, uh, burlap texture, and the other two panels will have text. And so, just to give you an example, and then they also can be attached to the wall, coming out at an angle. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Brother Amir? Brother Amir, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Let me take a quick, can I take a quick that break? That was beautiful. Can I take a quick break? Yes. Okay. Give me a, a, a give me about a minute. Okay. Um, I guess I did take the opportunity to share. At that time, I thought that his, 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 his colors was uh, beautiful, very warm. Uh, 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 his texture that he, he used, um, I thought was unique. Um, I thought the, uh, uh, the, the posters of the Muslim journals and the different articles uh, that he used within a, a Qibla uh, direction and his choice of uh, 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 um, 
of not uh, uh, of returning back in a positive light in the contribution. Anyone else like to share anything? Well, Shalom Aleikum. I was going to wait till you came back at the end of the presentation. That was beautiful. I would like to see know, that up in our space one day, inshallah. inshallah. But yeah, I will wait for him to come back at the end of the presentation and say something. He, Thank you. Um, you might not have been on when he first came on. Um, no, I was trying to get uh, One of his professors was Ann Saunders. Oh, really? Yeah, see, I like her work. I can see that. I can see that. Yeah. I can see her work in there. Yeah. Her influence, yeah. not her work, but yeah. oh yeah, I missed that. I'm little that really say something to him now because you know I like yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that was beautiful. Well, I did not hear um where he went. Is he back. supposed to be coming back? back. Oh, okay, back. I'll ask at the end of this. Okay. So I'm like thank you for thank you for the break. <laughs> Yes. And so what I like to do is begin talking about another body of work, which is my banjo series, and then leave some time for us to have some dialogue uh, after that. So. One of the things that it's, it's any artist, you constantly wonder, and what are you going to do next sometimes? And I, the decision the, did not come from me. It actually came from my students. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk about the historical aesthetics uh, response that I had to the banjo in relation to Africa. And one of the things that's interesting that the banjo is a African instrument and all, all the lectures I've been given, I've been coming across different audiences who weren't even aware that the banjo was had any association with the uh, with Africa and thought it was a Southern hillbilly instrument. And, and the reality is that it was a, a string instrument that was inspired by the Kora, the Nia TT, the Zamla, the uh, uh, Salam. And so here it is, all these different type of string instruments that came from West Africa and Central Africa uh, wind up surviving the Atlantic slave travel and wind up being made and, and utilized in, during the uh, slavery. In this particular painting, it's a watercolor painting done by John Rose, who actually uh, owned the plantation. This is called the Old Plantation, which he did this painting of his slaves, those individuals who were enslaved on his plantation. And as you, if you notice to your right, you see the string instrument. And you see the, uh, him, and you also see a guy playing the drums. You also see a woman holding a, a towel, which has some, maybe some beads, some rocks in it, and make a sound and by, by jiggling it. And so here it is that there's some kind of celebration is taking place. It could be a wedding, it could be a number of things, but, uh, but the reality is that look, they're well-dressed and there was something about this image that really drew my attention in terms of wanting to share this because it, it makes me know that we as African Americans have contributed to America in a way that people just don't understand. Matter of fact, Thomas Jefferson in his, in his diary, in his journal, wrote that one of the greatest contributions to uh, America from, by Africans was the banjo. He, he talked mm -hmm. about how they used to make them and play the banjos on his plantation. But what's interesting also is that there's an artist by the name of Henry Oswatana. And <laughs> Henry Oswatana did this painting, which he's very well known for, called The, the Banjo Lesson in 1893. And, and it, it, it shows an old man and a young kid together, being brought together by this African, this African string instrument, the banjo. And so it's, to me, that's a very powerful statement in terms of showing the relationship between one generation and another generation. And there's something that's very, has this, uh, this uh, relationship back to Africa. Also during the same particular period, uh, there's an artist by the name Mary Catset who uh, did a painting called The Banjo Lesson in 1893 as well. And she was white. And her painting was of a woman with a little girl playing the banjo. And some of them, they had a little boy standing in the background. But, but it's interesting because they both were from Philadelphia. Tanner was from Philadelphia. Cassette was from Philadelphia during the same period. So I was, it makes me wonder how, how the, was the banjo a major subject during that period? Because during that particular period, 
many white businessmen, there were some white businessmen who started their own have having banjos made and selling these banjos as elevated instruments. Even in one of the ads that I found when I was at the Smithsonian talked about how they said, oh, this is not the, uh, 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 the, the, the unelevated African uh, banjo. This is, this, is, it been, this is the new banjo and so forth. And talk about it's made of metal. And, and just as a result, totally took control by giving banjos to women, wealthy families, women, and teach them how to play it so it could become associated as an elevated instrument along with the violin and so forth, which I thought was just really, really interesting. When I show my students this slide, they one year the student said, uh, Professor, are you an artist, right? I said, yes. Yeah. Say, well, have you created any artwork talking about that? And I'm like, wow, I haven't. And, and, <laughs> and their words, their words push me in that direction, which I started working on a banjo series. And here are some of the uh, pieces that I actually uh, uh, created during, uh, during this period. So not only did I had to, this, they made me think about the banjo in the context of string instruments related by, by other artists who, are, who actually incorporated the banjo as part of their artistic uh, uh, freedom, such as Tanner. And then we look at contemporary artists in music, such as uh, uh, Carolina's Chocolate Drop and so forth. They are, the, the banjo is it's been uh, uh, brought back to its original uh, uh, interest, which was by African-Americans in early America. And now we're seeing not only, uh, we're seeing a lot more of it now today. This is my studio in Southern Illinois, and I had started. I wanted to. I had to figure out how I was going to approach this, dealing with the banjo, and I wind up taking, looking at, one to create a sculpture form, but, but I want it to be abstract. I want to, but I want the aesthetics to be, have the aesthetics to have the uh, be afrocentric, and so I spent a, a lot of time trying to figure that out in the studio, look, looking, collecting this these woods. And actually, the first three pieces I did were actually painted on. I treated them as canvases and not uh, 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 symbolic uh, forms to talk about the banjo. But I treated them as that I was painting, uh, doing a painting for uh, uh, <laughs> on a canvas. And so I realized mm -hmm. that after I showed those three paintings of of the banjos in Chicago at the African International House or the International African House in uh, Chicago. That I came back to my studio and I saw these pieces in my studio and I said, listen, I can't paint on these. And this means my, when my studio looking at a piece, I had to elevate myself to look down on it because sometimes I have them on the floor, sometimes I have them on the table just to be able to see how they are being constructed. And so I found myself, I can't paint on none of these. So I, when I went and looked at the, uh, uh, the Smithsonian, went to their website and tried to find some banjos that were made during by slaves of early in America, I found I saw that a lot of them had br different brown tones. Not a lot of them look raw and rough because they had age, and so that kind of kind of motivated me to stick with the the raw material. And so as a result, these are some of the pieces that it was on the wall when I got back to my studio. Said, "Listen, I can't paint on these." And as a result of making these decisions on how I want to go about making these uh, these these symbols these symbolic images of the banjo uh, that I invited three directors from different museums to come to my studio. And the gentleman there is Peter Gunnan. And he, uh, is, was the, he was the director of the Chris Museum. And then I had uh, uh, Rusty Freeman who came from the Mitchell Museum in Mount Vernon, Illinois. And then John Liquid uh, who was from the State Museum uh, uh, in uh, Illinois State Museum. And it's kind of interesting because when John saw the pieces, he kept just looked up and said, oh, they're raw, raw, they're raw, raw. You must keep them raw, you must keep them raw. I thought that was interesting because he just, he, he liked the fact that they look or they reference the, the, the banjos that, are, uh, that were made in that period that are still around. He thought the connection was there. Rusty Freeman looked at him and saw him and he thought, he, he, just, he just, he automatically said he needed five of them to put into an exhibition with some signature guitars that were signed by B.B. King, Nick Jagger, and so forth. 
And so he had an interest in the work as well. And then then uh, uh, Peter here uh, said, offered me the, uh, ex a solo exhibition and he wanted to see how the work evolved over a two year period before I had the exhibition, which uh, wound up being a, uh, not only having the exhibition, but he had, wound up doing a 52 page color catalog of the exhibition. While I was there, while, when I decided I need to know more about African string instruments, so I made a decision to use my sabbatical to go do research at the African Art Museum in the Warner uh, uh, M. Robbins, uh, Robbins uh, Library in 2016. And uh, uh, the head librarian, uh, Janet uh, Stanley, she was very, very helpful. I had an opportunity to look at so many different African string instruments, Different, matter of fact, Gambia was one that, come, that held my attention the most in terms of African string instruments, but they have such an unbelievable amount of resource. I encourage everybody to go to that museum and take a look at the resources that they have uh, on, on African art. When I was also in doing my sabbatical, I was constantly spending time, a lot of time going back and forth over to the American Islamic Heritage Museum in Washington, D.C. And while I was there, I came across an image by, uh, by the director, Amir, who showed me this image that I thought was really interesting because it blew my mind. Because here I am looking at banjos, but then he shows me this one, this banjo here, which has like a crescent on it and a, a star, which you can see at the, right up at the, look, which look, mm -hmm. almost look like a face, if I may. But if you go down toward the, where the, 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 uh, the skin of the uh, banjo, you'll see another crest in the star, which is symbolic of Islam, and it's usually noted as an Islamic symbol. And so I, I, I say, I gotta have a copy of this image. And so as a result, uh, I, was, I was inspired even more to see the connection between the African-American experience and this whole idea of Islam and this whole idea of the banjo. Now I wanna show you four particular paintings and uh, the, each one of these paintings reflect a period in uh, uh, the Atlantic slave trade. And so this image that you're looking at is uh, of the Atlantic Ocean. And this particular uh, banjo is solid, no open form. It looked like a ship floating across the top of the water. If you look at it close, if you notice, you see little dark areas of burlaps, strings all just moving through the uh, surface, where that, the string represent the bodies that were thrown off the slave ship into the uh, ocean. As they continued, as the stations continued to head toward America. Those bodies that was thrown into the ocean, and they even I've read stories where they said slaves actually jumped up, they rather died than, than to be taken, taken away, and they jumped the ship. And cause some stories that I've, I've I've been exposed to. Not what I know, but what I was what I was exposed to. And so here it is, the banjo made it. It survived that Atlantic slave trade. Uh, and, 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 and I felt that I wanted to communicate how deadly it was, but at the same time, how strong it, it, that idea of the string instrument was for the African that they continued to make them once they got to America. This one represents the plantation. He obviously the color green, the burlap surface. But what I found interesting is that the African, also I found out there's an African string, and so I wanted to give it some aesthetics, African aesthetics, where you see the one that's sitting in the center of the, of the canvas, almost like an African mask. This whole idea of this connection of aesthetics, African aesthetics that plays in African art, and I want to incorporate that with a string instrument. And then the Cora, which is, has a long neck and a big goal. I thought it was really interesting, and I want to, to, to use that as a, a way of saying the piece that's in the center is responding to the Africans who were in America who were making banjos, and the larger piece represent the, the musical instrument that was making over in Africa. And then at the base, you'll see these little sticks in this little opening. It's almost uh, taking a, a kind of pull from the idea of the, uh, the a fetish piece, where it has an opening in the stomach, and you put things in there and so forth. And I, 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 I was connecting with that during that particular uh, uh, engagement with this uh, piece. The third piece, Revolt, 
this idea of me creating this little small structure form of banjo, meaning that they were, no one's thinking about the banjo <laughs> as much as they were thinking about their freedom. This idea of fighting and revolting and fighting against the, uh, uh, this institution of uh, slavery that existed uh, in America uh, then, uh, and, and that, that chattel slavery, in, in other words. And so uh, I, I wanted to, to say that the banjo still was a part of the African -American, African American experience, but at the same time, there was something going on in America that was making things really, really, uh, gosh. Well, you, it's self-explanatory. I mean, every time I talk about it, I get, I get fired up because that love of energy. And that's why the colors that they are. And even the, the, this whole idea of this opening in the center, I wanted, I didn't put no burlap in the center there. This whole idea of this kind of almost look like a, a, a ferno was the heat. But we're talking about uh, emotional and, and, uh, and, and, and this emotional heat or spiritual heat, you know, that comes out and that makes one fight for freedom. This is a detailed shot of the burlap. I'm just going to show you some of the smaller pieces that I responded to, just so you can see some of the individual banjo pieces that I had created in response to uh, uh, my students' encouragement. <laughs> Now, this is the last piece, and uh, it says, take me with you. I uh, did this in 2019, and I, it's actually the piece that's inside the trunk. And I, I, when I when in, my re in the research, I found uh, that it made me ask the question, why didn't the banjo, why didn't African American take the banjo up north and, and made it, uh, and it become a major instrument, you know, once they left the South? Why did why did we, it almost seem like it was almost abandoned? And in terms of even though there was still individuals playing it, and, and then a lot of people thought the when think of the banjo, think of the minstrel show, black faces. So this whole idea maybe there was an attitude that they didn't that they didn't they had different concerns. Uh, they added that the people wouldn't have an interest in the banjo in a way that they felt they could uh, uh, continue to engage it. That's so many of actually picked up the a guitar. A lot of uh, interesting music came out of those individuals who played the banjo, who decided to play the guitar when they went north, and it changed, and that just changed the whole direction of uh, of the art world, the uh, music art world as we know it. And so, with that, I'd like to have, leave it to uh, open up for some questions and dialogue. Okay, Alhamdulillah, man, excellent, very beautiful, very warm. Um, and I thank you for uh, with, uh, showing the uh, banjo with, with the crescent. Yeah. Um, now, in your um, research, because um, I heard you say that, you know, that we didn't bring it up north. And mm -hmm. I just was wondering if that was a, 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 a process that they used to get us disconnected from the banjo. Yes. Were, were, did we use the banjo as a means for communication? During the times of being enslaved, I'm just wondering. I, I, what, 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 some of the music that I've listened to, do, do, some of the music that was uh, that uh, that was uh, played by Africans, African Americans uh, during that period, was very uplifting. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, it was, a, it was something that 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 it it it, uh, it was something that really got to, went to the spirit of, of of the of the community. When they play, normally when they play, they played it for their families or they played it for an immediate community and people were listening, they would enjoy it. And they would, you know, I almost say, I like, to, uh, if I may, you know, there's almost like Sundays being at church. And you just, I remember my grandmother and them and my auntie just charged up, they, they being inspired. And so it's something about that string instrument that did something in terms of, and even today, if we look at the guitar, the way some people listen to it, and, no, 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 it moves you, it, it does something. And it, I think that, I don't think, I think that the reason they didn't continue it is based on a lot of the things that I found when I was at the African Art Museum or at the Smithsonian Museum, because they also was getting me uh, literature and information from other parts of the, of the mall. So, so what I thought was interesting that there was a campaign amongst white businessmen to de-appreciate the African banjo 
and elevate their banjo they want to market for financial gain. Uh, so, and, and that could be the process because see, you know, uh, music, you know, in, in my beliefs and understanding, you, you have uh, Dawood, David is the first one that they say use the instrument in the Bible and they use a harp, which the was harp, a string yeah. instrument to heal. They use the music to heal the sick, you know, to muse us, you know, to heal you. That uh, that so those some of the string instruments can be very soothing, can be very healing. And then just like you say, within creation of the art, there's a certain hidden beauty with that we can see visually. Mm -hmm. Well, same thing with music, you know, there's with certain tones. Now, I just wonder if that okay. banjo was producing a certain tone that was producing a certain positiveness out of us and they want I, 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 I was I would say definitely yes even when we look at the uh, the, uh, 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 the music by the chocolate Carolina chocolate drop Carolina chocolate drop when you look at their music and listen to it it's kind of interesting because here you got a group of individuals playing the banjo but yet they if you look at their background they've been formally they've been uh, they've been they've been formally educated in classical music <laughs> mm. So mm -hmm. you know, so here's individuals who play, do classical music. You play and find it a uh, a way of bringing the banjo back, not only in terms of as a as a, as an elevated interest um, elevated instrument, but also they say we are classical we classical artists and we understand what that means, and so we know that this the importance of this instrument. We have we invest our, edu uh, our resources in our education. We invest uh, resources in our, in our professional career, and we know the importance of this this instrument. And so, mm -hmm. and this, I think that I think this uh, that uh, I think that has was a a marketing strategy that disconnected a lot of individuals from the banjo, and as a result, not only from the banjo itself, but from the whole history of the banjo. And that's why I felt the need to go to the African Art Museum to look at the African string instrument. So because I've really needed more from that perspective in order to move forward with the body of work that I created. Alhamdulillah. Beautiful and work. Jazakallahu. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Now, any thoughts or any suggestions uh, or ideas that you would like to offer um, any young adults, African-American Muslims uh, that are in the, um, into the art or, or even think they want to be in the art expression? I, I, one of the things, one of the things that is that do not, the, one of the beautiful things about the art world, and I think young people really need to know this, is that bringing something to the table that's not there is very good. Just because it's not there, that's not a bad thing. It's an opportunity. Mm. And so I've learned from my own experience that the opportunity that was presented to be able to work on this type of work the Fatiha series, I did a breast cancer series and so forth and so on, the banjo series, that there was opportunities that was given to me to be able to utilize what I had learned in academic, during my academic career and brought it into my professional career. So I would say, don't look at something that's not there as a bad thing. Matter of fact, the course that I teach a course on African-American art history, it wasn't no course. I wrote a proposal to say to, to teach it. Now it's been, it's been taught since 1997. And when I talk to my colleagues in other universities, they say, oh, it's a survey course? No. They're part of a survey course? No, it's, it's actually an independent course. They say, oh, OK. And so I think the young people, they really need to be able to appreciate the unknown, appreciate what that may not be there, and, and, and be willing to go ahead and, and, and move forward with it. I think it's that they, they, have the, they need to really understand that they have the power and the capacity to be able to accomplish things, you know, uh, that they may not know. They say, "What is the saying that uh, it's only impossible until someone do it?" Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think that. Uh, so I was. I would tell them that you know to patiently persevere, because that's good, because when, in, in, in any in regards to what you're studying or what your career you choose, art is one of those careers that sometimes people don't see as a financial <laughs> uh, reward. They don't see the financial reward associated with it. And because, but they have to remember there are different parts of the art world. The art world is not one dimensional. You know, mm -hmm. there's a bit, there's a side of the art world that's very uh, uh, elitist, if I may. There's a side of the art world that's very folk artists and grassroots, you know. 
you then you got a part of the art world that deals with uh, 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 infographics and information and so forth. And so it, 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 it's, it's, I mean, I can go on and on. You have curators, you have uh, collectors, you have, it's just so, it's so, it's so many uh, uh, personalities in the art world that you had to find, find where you find your niche, where do you find your place? Cause you can't do all of it, but you make and do one or two or three of them. And so as a result, I would tell them to patiently persevere, find out where you, your niche is, try to accept that you can do the, what does not have been done and move forward. And, and, and the last, lastly, last, talk to somebody. <laughs> talk to somebody. I tell students, young people, you young, talk to somebody. You know, uh, I don't care. I tell you guys to see a psychiatrist, but you got to talk to somebody. Communicate, 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 share your ideas, talk about what you're going through, talk about what you're feeling, because that gives you the opportunity to be able to assess and look at your situation as a student and as a professional artist in a more practical and realistic way. Alhamdulillah, excellent. Uh, I want to change the channel just a fraction. Please do. Um, have you ever looked at the, the early years of Imam Worthy Muhammad um, when he came in the transitional years, he used art to communicate. Actually, actually he, when, he came, when he came to uh, Southern Illinois, he came to Southern Illinois. And he was with uh, Paul Simon, the, the, the former, uh, the late uh, Paul Simon, who was the uh, senator. And, oh, okay, okay. And he came, they came to SIU and, and Paul Simon wanted to see the imam, they knew each other. And while I was with them, uh, I got introduced to the imam and they had told him, they told the imam that I was a, a art professor. And uh, they said, uh, he said, oh, alhamdulillah. And then he, she said, he said, yes, I draw a picture of mine, I got one here. And he had a little old drawing a little dry and they just blew my mind. And he was saying, he said that, I remember him saying that, I'm paraphrasing, that he said that, he said, we need people who have creative minds. We need creative minds, yeah. people who could be able yeah. to, you know, bring things into the existence. And so, I, yes, I, yeah, I was definitely aware of his, uh, his, uh, his, some of his work. Yeah, hey, cause look, now I got alhamdulillah. Uh, one of the, what was it? Four Sundays of them times. Um, I he sold his works. I think he sold three of his drawings. Hmm. So I was able to buy three of his drawings. Oh, but the other art that I was talking about in the transitional years, yeah. where he was moving the community from uh, um, nationalism into spirituality, where hmm. where he said from the walking out of darkness and to come into uh, serving Allah. You know, into the uh, uh, into the light. Yes. This is what I, 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 I love that design. Yeah, 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 and, and he did so many of them, uh, had so many of them done for the spirituality of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I have not seen nobody yet explore the the, the spirituality uh, of the work, Islamic work during those transitional years. You know, it's kind of interesting. Muhammad Ali, uh, when I was uh, in New York, I, I, I was with a group of individuals and we uh, went to New York and I had the opportunity to meet a collector who lit, had a town, I mean, I, I had a townhouse, a penthouse. And we had went up to the penthouse and look at some, uh, look at her collection. And she had, as soon as you come in the door, right on the wall was two drawings by Muhammad Ali. And she mm -hmm. really wanted me to see those cause you know, she, cause she had, when she, they say, oh, this is not, you know, that, uh, and she said, oh, you Muslim? I said, yes, I'm Muslim. She said, oh, I got something that I think you're going to like. And we got up there and I took, I had an opportunity to see this white woman who was very wealthy, who was very excited to have these particular drawings in her collection. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and it was, and, and was treated, and was very hospitable. And so I think that, and then they, ma'am, someone of his status, status, I mean, the, the, the son of Elijah Muhammad, a man with Muhammad who's, 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 led the community in a, in a very peaceful way where there was no confrontation that people could even talk about between the nation of Islam and the, uh, and, 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 uh, the Muslim, uh, the Blali uh, community. And so here it is that uh, it's, 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 it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's a beautiful thing. And I, and I think, the, I think the, the creative arts that Allah has made us, uh, has given us the power of expression. It's talked about in the Quran. The Quran, and then the Quran it says, and this, and if I, I hope I ain't misquoting, but it says, Allah has endowed you with the power of expression. That's the translation. Yes, yeah. So if that's if this if this is if we understand this to be true, then we need to pay more attention to the creation. 
Yes, and this is one reason why, and I'm, I'm glad you said that, this is one reason why we we, we uh, show the arts, you know, not only the visual art, but the spoken mm -hmm. word is an art, yes. as well as music. You know, we take a lot of jabs, you know, behind music because people are in the different perception, but music is an expression, and if you d use it rightfully, it can be a very positive, motivating um, expression yes, uh, uh, yes, to help sir. soothe the soul. Yes, uh, I think I'm going to open up for anybody that like to ask any questions as we come to uh, closing. This is time for y'all that Ms. Habib and Naji. Yes, I'm like um, I want to thank you. That I really enjoyed your presentation and the, and the artwork is amazing. That's, that's the banjos. And we're going to have to really get our building in show live. We're going to have to have your exhibit. Oh, I, it would be, it'd be, I would, whatever I can do, and alhamdulillah, uh, I'm, I'm definitely open. All right, alhamdulillah. Thank you so much. And I love, and I, my husband took me when you took the break, um, you had opened up and talked about one of your teachers was Ann Saunders. Yes. I love, I have like three or four pieces of her work. Is that, yes, is that one of her pieces right behind your head, isn't it? Oh. Behind me? me? Uh, At now, the top of the door? Now behind, no, that's from Senegal. Now that one is. Yeah. That one is? Yes. Yeah, I, I have that. One of the first pieces. <laughs> not the original. You probably got the original. <laughs> <laughs> it's a print of her husband. I, actually, did. I got a print. It's a print. Oh, OK. I had to have one. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I have a couple of hers downstairs. But I appreciate your work. And, and thank you for coming on to Amir. I'm delighted. We hope that we can any of these, these Zoom programs, are good. Well, I appreciate the inv invite, and uh, yes. and, and, uh, and this it's always a, a pleasure to be able to share the many perspectives. Okay. You know, it's interesting that I have to have to deal with the fact that I am a Muslim in my work. I do the fact that I am black, black dealing in my work. Right. I have to deal with being American in my work. I'm, I'm, I'm multi-dimensional, so. That's right. That's right. I'm the lit shows. I'll continue to bless you. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Assalamu alaikum. Black out in America. What's up? <laughs> What's up, Najah? How, How you doing, doing Najee? All right, all right, man. I, I've, I've enjoyed the dialogue. I just wanted to, uh, I really don't have a question because I feel like I know just about just about all there is to know about my brother, but I just want to publicly <laughs> acknowledge, man, your contribution to the um, to the culture, you know, to everything that you, you, you've you done to create a space for young cats like me, you know, uh, and to be and be supportive, you know, with, with a lot of students, those that were students in the university as well as those that were just students in the in the, in the neighborhood, you know. So yes, sir. Uh, yeah, may a lot of Would you help teach? Uh, well, you know, <laughs> hey man, it's, it's it's this is this is this is, this is about you though. So and I just want to I just want to acknowledge you know acknowledge acknowledge everything that you've done to be supportive of myself and so many others and and lives that you've changed through art. And a lot of people don't really understand uh, how important you've been. In so many lives, and and I think about everything that we do in, in relationship to Black Art in America, and and, and and the different facets of what we do in art world. You know, I, I would, you know, it's, it's I couldn't I couldn't imagine that even taking place had it not been for, you know, you pulling me into the studio, you know, 26, 27, 28 years ago, and, and saying, hey man, there's an opportunity for you. So I just want to publicly acknowledge that. You know, I love you, appreciate you, and uh, and I've enjoyed the program. So, so like, um, thank you. Thanks, so, not you. No, no, not you. Naji, Naji, come back, my brother. Please come back. <laughs> look, look, look. Okay. Is that your artwork in back of you? Oh no, that's part of our collection. Yeah, we, my wife and I, we, we you know, we're avid collectors and supporters of African American art. Yeah, you should visit our website, blackheartinamerica.com, when you get a chance. Okay, alhamdulillah. Look, look, look. Take your time. Plug. Take. Give yourself a plug. <laughs> uh, just uh, you know, invite the audience to visit blackartinamerica.com. It's uh, it's our platform where we document, preserve, and promote the contributions of the African American art community. Uh, we're a multifaceted company. We do a number of different things, from you know articles and podcasts, and and uh, sharing those stories in that capacity to 
we're active art dealers. We have a, 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 a thriving e-commerce uh, site where we offer work by artists of color. That's at buyblackart.com. We produce art shows in major markets around the country. So yeah, just you know, visit. Feel free to visit the website blackartinamerica.com is a site, and you can find us on all your favorite social media channels. Yes. All right. Thank you. I'm good. Thank you. All right. All right. All right. All right. Wa alaikum assalam. Right. Yes, sir, my brother. Any closing remarks? Uh, the only thing I would say is that uh, uh, I would encourage people to support the American Islamic Heritage Museum. It's a your institution is a very important and valuable institution that did not exist. And as I mentioned earlier, we need to bring it into existence. And I think that it's going. I think it's going to. I think that it's going to be around. It's, it's timeless. That the, the people for a thousand years from now, I believe, going to be talking about the American Islamic Heritage Museum. And I just encourage people to understand this how important it is and to contribute to it financially. Late, do your work, work, whatever you can do. And if you find something, the very some rich, valuable uh, artifact. Remember that. Remember you all, and so I, I, that's what I would like to say in closing, because uh, I understand how important and how valuable your institution is. Our institution. Thank you. Our institution. Right, very good. There you go. Once we take ownership, it's ours. Mashallah. Yes, yes, that's yes. a start. Thank you, man. Excellent job. And to be continued. And we're looking for some of your input and suggestions to bring on people that we can highlight. Oh, yes, sir. We'll do. All right. We'll do. Thank you. Well, we're going to record it, document, and put it up. Yes, and I sir. thank you, man. Mashallah. Assalamu alaikum, my brother. Assalamu alaikum to everyone else. Yes.